okay, well, how much time are you spending in actually trying to build a relationship with God? Because if you're not doing that, you ain't going to see God. To you, God might not be real because you're not spending time in His Word. And so we need to be doing that each and every day. We need to be allowing God to speak into our hearts. And one of the most profound ways that we can do that is by digging into His Word, which is the Bible. And so today's sermon, I want this to be able to impact your head. I want you guys to know more about the Bible. I want you to know more about having a healthy relationship with Jesus Christ. But not only do I want that to just fill your head with all this Bible knowledge, but I want that to flow down into your heart. And I truly believe that when you allow Jesus Christ to transform your heart, the things that you do with your hand, your actions are going to be different because people aren't going to know that you are a Christian, not because of the Bible knowledge that you have, not because of the things in our hearts, but it's through the actions that we are showing the rest of the world. And so, in order for that to happen, we need to be applying God's word. I would have failed you as a pastor if today you just come to church and you're like, that was a good message, but you don't do anything else with that. So you believe in one God, so that's fine because even the demons believe that and they tremble with fear. So just knowing that, okay, so I know the Bible or I know about God, that's not good enough because even Satan knows a lot about God. The difference between Satan and us is we know about him and we're actually trying to put him into our life. We're actually trying to put that into action. We need to be applying the word of God. This is today's comment, and it says, Wow, how that Moses can show our driveway so fast. <laughs> Hasn't this been our struggle this entire winter, right, you guys? Okay. And then here's one more just for fun and giggles. A sign of spring robins in our front yard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how many times have we seen it in Wisconsin, right? Where all the snow is gone, the robins come back, and then we still get another blizzard afterwards, right? Okay. Only in Wisconsin. And so uh, this month, it is the month, uh, the month of March. And so our current sermon series that we're going to focus on it's everything related to March, okay? It's the month of March. The sermon series is going to be involving the word March. And so for this reason, today's sermon titled, it is titled, March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. So, uh, like, if you have never heard of that, it's okay. Because this is one of those sayings that maybe, unless you've heard of it for a long time, it's an American saying that's a little bit different. And so then my question to us today is, what does it mean by the lion and the lamb? The Bible makes lots of references to both of these animals. But a lot of times, you know, like if we're not thinking about it, there's actually a symbolism in the lion and the lamb. So you might also be asking yourself, what does it mean by the lion and the lamb? So today, we're going to dig a little bit more into the Bible to try to understand this concept of uh, the lion and the lamb, lamb. So today, if there's one thing that you guys can walk away and just remember, one simple thing is this. Jesus, he is the lion and the lamb. So, if tonight you're thinking about the sermon, if there's only one thing that you can remember, it's that Jesus is the lion and the lamb. Okay, so we have had a crazy and epic and historical winter of our lifetime. So, I have never, in my 30 year, 38 years of being alive, I don't remember such a formidable winter like this winter. We have set records that's unprecedented. So only in our lifetime will we probably ever see this again. So this might be the last one because it was so extreme. So according to AOW News 9 uh, meteorologist Sam Kuffel said that the last big bad Tuesday, you guys remember that just a few weeks ago we had that big bad snowstorm on Tuesday? 
So that's set a record for the most snowfall in one day for Wausau. We picked up in Wausau 15.7 inches of snow. We got dumped on, and that was our largest one-day snowstorm ever in Wausau history. The old one was 13 inches from 1908. So we broke a 100-year-old record. None of us are 100 years old. We probably won't see this for another 100 years. You probably won't be alive. I probably won't be alive to see that. But it is epic to just know that we broke a 100-year-old record, the most snowfall in all of recorded history in Wausau. In total, 54.3 inches of snow fell in Wausau in February. The previous record for the snowiest month ever was for the city was set in December 2008 when Wausau got 37.6 inches of snow according to the National Weather Service. Okay? So our record in the past was like 30 something and this one we got over 50. Again, we probably won't see this ever again in our lifetime. Let's hope and pray, right? Is yes. that? <laughs> All right, we don't need to be breaking more records next winter. Is that? All right. So how is this related to this, this idea of March, okay? And so again, March, when we think about March, there's this American saying, and it goes, March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. Now, how many of you guys are like, Pastor Yao, I have never heard of that saying before. Anybody never heard of that before? Raise your hand. Okay? All right? So there's a few of us, okay? And so then you might be thinking, okay, so Pastor Yao, how is this concept of weather lying like a lamb? How is that related to the Bible? And so it's actually related to the Bible in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5 to 6. And here it says, but one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open up the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. Okay. So in my three years that I have been preaching, this is the first Sunday that I'm preaching from the book of Revelation. Okay? The book of Revelation is not an easy book to digest. It is very, very complicated. It is very difficult. Okay? So, I want you guys to know that the book of uh, Revelation, it comes to us from the Bible. In the Bible, there are two different parts of the Bible. There is called, what is the Old Testament, okay? So the Old Testament contains all the Abraham, Moses, all those really old stories about the Bible. And then, it also has the New Testament. So basically, it's talking about the time of Jesus and everything that happened after Jesus. The book of Revelation is found right there. The book of Revelation is the very last book of the entire Bible. And so when we talk about the book of Revelation, what it's really talking about is Jesus revealing to us or unveiling what is going to be happening at the end times. So some people get really freaked out about this, but the reality is this world that we live in, it is not going to last forever. One day, Jesus is going to come back, and when he's going to come back, what he's going to do is he's going to destroy everything that's evil, sinister about this place. But the good news is this, that to all of us believers, he is going to take us back home to be with our Father. The book of Revelation, it talks about how all these events are going to happen. But I want you guys to know this is the most complicated and weirdest book in the entire Bible. So I'm actually, so like, you know how you're supposed to be reading your Bible just for your personal devotion every day? So I'm currently actually going through the book of Revelation. And sometimes you get to some parts of Revelation and you're like, God, that is so weird. 
That is so different. There's all these mythical monsters and beasts and one animal has got like seven different heads and seven different creatures' heads. It's just weird. It's like a sci-fi thing. It's hard for me to like imagine all these different creatures, okay? But that's the book of Revelation. If you read it, if it doesn't make sense, it's okay because it's very complicated. All right. So let's take a look at this. Let's talk about the, the lion first, okay? So it's the lion and lamb. And again, I told you guys, the lion and the lamb, that truly just represents Jesus. So a lot of times when you read the Bible and it's making reference to a lion and or a lamb, most of the time you would be correct to assume or to think that, yes, that's actually in reference to Jesus, okay? All right, so let's, let's take a look at Jesus being this lion. So in the African plains and in the jungles, who do we know is the king of the jungle? Okay? It is the lion, okay? So when you think about Jesus, right, okay, we also know that Jesus, he is the king of all kings. In the jungle, the lion is the king of the jungle. So when we hear in reference to a lion, this is basically the king. Jesus is also the king in our life. In Genesis chapter 49 verse 4, it says, Judah, my son is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. So Judah... If you guys don't know anything about Judah, Judah is the son of Jacob. So a long time ago, the entire people that's known as the Jewish people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, a long time ago, basically, they came from 12 different brothers. And from these 12 different brothers, they basically, when they went into the promised land, there were 12 different areas for the 12 different brothers to live in, those became tribes, okay? And so Jesus, Jesus, he actually came from the brother of Judah. And so when it makes reference to Judah, it's talking about where Jesus came from, the brother, um, the brother named Judah. And so they lived in Judah. So then, in here it says, my son, and so who do we know that's a reference to? Okay? That's reference to the Son of God, which is Jesus. And then it says, a young lion. Okay? So if you think about this, Jesus is the lion. And why is he the lion? Because it's talking about Judah, which is Jesus, my son. And then it says, and that son is a young lion, which is in reference to Jesus. So then it also says, it has finished eating its prey. So then this gives us the idea that it's a dominating, it's a strong animal that's able to take its prey. And who dares to rouse him? Who's going to mess with that lion? And so who is going to mess with the alpha lion? This is describing Jesus. So I want to throw this out there. What are some words to describe what a lion is like? When you think of a lion, what are some words that come to your mind that describes what a lion is like? What do you guys got? Laura? Fierce. Fierce. Anybody else? What's another word that you guys think of when you think of a lion? Okay. Ivan? Man eater. Man eater? Okay. <laughs> All right. Manny? Independent. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Shaw? King. King? Jeff? Fearless. Fearless. Dad? Powerful. Powerful. All right. So let's take a look. An alpha lion, okay? Strong. Powerful. Dominating. Fearless. Are all those pretty good description words about a lion? Yes. Okay. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus is a what? Jesus is a lion. And so he is strong, he is powerful, he is dominating, he is fearless. That alpha lion, he 
equates to Jesus Christ. This is the Jesus that is inside of all of us. The Bible tells us that when you and I, when we accept Jesus Christ into our heart, that the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. That means that we now have Jesus Christ living inside of us. But too often, this is the real lion that's really living in you and me. Check out this lion. Okay? Oh, it's a cute, soft, cuddly lion. Is this the lion that God wants us to have in our life? No. The answer is no. And so instead, what he wants us to have in our life, the characteristics of a true lion that represents Jesus. Now it's that lion. It's that mature lion. It is strong. It is powerful. It is dominating. It is fearless. That's what should be inside of you and in me. So as Christians, we need to stand strong and say, I've got the alpha lion inside of me, which is Jesus Christ. So when Satan comes around, when the temptations come around, when people come around trying to trip us, trying to attack us, trying to dominate us, we have to be strong and remember that Jesus Christ, the alpha lion, is inside of me. And how dare we cower? How dare we surrender? How dare we succumb to these people who got nothing close to what our God has in us? We need to be that strong lion to say, I've got Christ in me. I am fearless. I am powerful. I can do this. My God is in me. Okay? So then, the other part of this Bible verse, it talks about the Lamb. And so what does it mean that Jesus Christ is also the Lamb? Because it seems like... You know, we understand this just dominating lion, so strong and powerful. And then you come to this gentle creature that's a lamb. How does that even equate to Jesus, okay? All right, so I want to share a story with you guys here a little bit. I took this picture. Where do you guys think I took this picture? All right. This picture was taken when we did our mini missions as a soldier in Iraq, okay? I had never really seen just like regular sheep or goat in my life. You know, you don't see that around Wausau here, okay? You might get really lucky going to, you know, on a cruise in the country to see a, a sheep or a goat here, but really living in Wausau, you don't see these things. And so, you know, it was just so different. Uh, you know, in Wisconsin, you just see a lot of cows, right? That's like the one farm animal that you see a lot. And then you go to Iraq, and it's like, it's just sheep and goat everywhere. And so then I, I snapped this picture when we were on a mission. And so my friend, his name is Obi, the guy that's uh, inside of the red. And so, like, these, like, when, when the Iraqis saw me, they're like, hey, Yang! You Asian like us, okay? So to me, like when they looked at the Americans, they're like, oh, those are American soldiers. But yeah, it was so weird for them to see this Asian guy wearing this U.S. Army uniform. They're like, all right, we're, we're basically bros. We're homies. I understand you. You understand me. And so every time that they had the opportunity to just have a meal, they're like, gang, come and eat with us. And so then, because um, I was the only crazy monk person uh, there, so I would usually get these invites. And so they lived, they lived in the next room next to us. And so it was kind of, um, it was different at first going to Iraq. You know, like we hear that the Iraqis are, are like insurgents and their enemy. We get there, and they're like, hey, so the Iraqis are going to be uh, sleeping in the room next to you. And you're like, okay, oh, we're going to be safe. And then you start to develop a relationship with the Iraqis. 
And so the one day they're like, Gay, come and eat food with us. And you know, like, I had never seen what Iraqi food looks like, right? Okay? And so then, um, there's some of the Iraqi food, it looks a little bit different. But I uh, always said, Gang, what is really good is kebab, okay? I don't know if you guys have ever heard of kebab. Alright. But kebab is like, it's very, very good because it has sheep meat. And sheep meat help you to be strong, okay? You know, he's a pretty strong guy. And so he's like, it's very, very good. And so then, um, sometimes we, we would get to eat kebab. And so then, this picture, um, we were doing some other missions. And so sometimes the poor Iraqi children, they will come to us and they will say, do you want kebab? Because in the downtown area, they have their delis. And as a soldier, I just can't go to a deli in the downtown area because I'm gonna not make it out of their life. And so then some, so the, the US Army, they only fed us one time in two days, okay? And so then if you ever want to go to weight loss program, Iraq is definitely a great recommendation for you if you want to do some weight loss program. And so then uh, we would skip many meals because the US Army just went out to deliver food to us because we were in two dangerous in the area. So the Iraqi children, they're smart. They know that we don't get to eat that much. And they would come to the American soldier and they say, you want to kebab? And we're like, sure, because we haven't eaten. So then we would say, how many dollar? And they say, five dollar. So then we would give them five dollars. And I bet you it probably only cost them like one dollar. Okay? Because, you know, our American money is worth so much more than their Iraqi dinar. So then um, the, the, the children would take their five dollars. They would bike to the downtown area. And then like 25 minutes later, they would come back. And then we would get our kebab. And the kebab is sheep meat, okay? And so it actually turns out that if you've never had sheep meat before, it's actually very, very healthy, and it's actually very lean, and it's very good for you. And so it tasted wonderful. So that's my experience with lamb. All right, so, uh, so in John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, Jesus, the Lamb of God. So it's actually titled that. So it says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Of all the animals that John could have said, Oh, it's Jesus, the kangaroo. Or Jesus, the monkey. John says, Oh, look, it is the Lamb of God. And so, you know, when we think about a lamb, okay, we think of these cute, cuddly lambs, but really, the more biblical goal, lamb is the ones that are crucified, is the ones that are sacrificed, and I really love this picture because to me that's truly representative of Jesus Christ. He was that sacrifice for the entire world. So when you guys hear about a lamb in the Bible, a lot of times that's talking about sacrifice. Jesus Christ became the sacrifice on the cross for all of our sins. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, in fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So during the time of the Old Testament, every year they were at least to make one pilgrimage to the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. And they were supposed to go there so that they can get their sins forgiven. And so then... Uh, if, if they would go there and say, for example, if they committed a large sin, maybe such as adultery or murder, okay, then the animal that would have to be sacrificed for their sin, because it's such a big sin, would be a big animal. It might have to be a bull, something like that, because it's such a big sin, and so they needed the blood of that big animal to, to forgive them of their sins. And if it's a smaller sin, it might just be a dove or something like that, okay? But a lot of times, they would use the lamb to be a sacrificial animal. And so in the Old Testament times, the sacrifices before Jesus Christ, for their sins to be forgiven, an animal's blood would have to be shed for the forgiveness of their sins. That's what the law of God required. God said, in order for me to forgive you of your sins, 
an animal's blood must be um, given so that your sins can be forgiven. So that was before Jesus. They would go and sacrifice all these animals. And then, after Jesus, okay, after he came, so in the New Testament, the sacrifice was basically Jesus' crucifixion. And that's the reason why, again, in John chapter 1, verse 29, John points to Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ is going to be the one to take away the sins of the world because Jesus Christ will one day be crucified on the cross. He is going to shed blood on the cross. And because of that, your sins will be forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ alone. And so this is the powerful thing about the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, his one-time blood, is able to save us. Now, when you're Hmong, so a lot of Hmong people, I would say 90% of the Hmong people are shaman. And so for the shaman believers, they believe that every time a person gets sick, it's because some sort of a demonic spirit has taken over that person's soul and spirit. And so in order for that person to get well and to get better again, you must sacrifice an animal to appease the demonic spirits so that they will leave a person alone. You see, the, the Hmong religion of shamanism, it continues to enslave the Hmong people because we have to continually be sacrificing all these animals, pigs, cows and chickens, so that the spirits will be happy. When the spirits are happy, they'll leave the spirit of that person alone. And so every year, all these animal sacrifices must be done. The Hmong people become enslaved to Satan because we have to do all these animal sacrifices. But the amazing story of Jesus Christ is when he died on that cross, Jesus says, the one time, my crucifixion, my blood on the cross, this one time that I am going to die for all of humanity is good enough. We don't have to continually sacrifice Jesus time and time again so that our sins can be forgiven. What Jesus Christ did one time on the cross over 2,000 years ago was enough to redeem us every time we sin. And that's the reason why God is so gracious. Because he's already done that just one time. And that's good enough. And that's the reason why Jesus is the Lamb. Jesus is the sacrifice that we all need in our life. Praise the Lord for that. Okay? So not only does the Bible make reference to Jesus as the Lamb... But we too sometimes are that lamb. Jesus not only is the lamb, but in different parts of the Bible, that lamb is you and me. We are that lamb. And the reason why is because sometimes we know that sheep, they can be very stubborn, they can also not listen. They can be defiant. They can do their own will. What does that kind of describe? That describes us. God's like, hey, I'm the shepherd. Please come over here. Stay away from that wolf. It's going to eat you if you keep on going over there. Come over here. I am going to protect you. I am going to shelter you. But sometimes we, that lost and rebellious lamb, we decide that we're not going to follow Jesus. We're not going to listen to our shepherd. And we go astray. But thankfully when we do that, Jesus, he is continually looking for us. So as I stand here today in front of all of you, I know that there's broken people out there. I know that there are people that have been astray from God. You have taken yourself so far away from God, and you're lost. 
You're in this dark place. You don't know what to do with your life. And I'm here today to tell you that Jesus Christ is the answer for your life. I don't know how that happens, but somehow through the miracle and the power of Jesus, something powerful happens when we transform our life to say, I gotta stop listening to me. I gotta stop being the God of my life. And I have to start listening to my shepherd, Jesus Christ. What does he want for me to do? You need to start turning your life back to the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why Jesus Christ, he is the Lamb of God. He is the Lion of Judah. That is Jesus Christ. And so I hope that now you guys can understand how this concept of the Lion of the Lamb is related to March. March comes in like a lion, powerful, very strong. But we hope that by the end of this month, this weather is going to be gentle. It is going to be kind. That it's going to go out like a lamb. Okay? And so Jesus Christ, he is that lion and he is that lamb. So here's kind of some inspirational things for you guys. I grew up not knowing a whole lot about sheep, okay? And so this might be really brand new information for all of you about sheep. Sheep spend their days eating grass. That's what they love to do. I don't know how sheep make it in Wisconsin, okay? I, I seriously don't know. The only thing that I think that could make sheep survive in Wisconsin is Mary had a little lamb, right? It was white as snow. That's about my only connection about how sheep can make it here in Wisconsin because maybe they're just camouflaged in the snow. Hour after hour, after hour, they're just eating grass. Eating is pretty much all that they do all day long. It sounds very peaceful. Doesn't that sound really peaceful? Like, man, you're just eating and eating all day. I mean, some of us, we would love to do that, okay? But this constant eating actually creates problems. For starters, when sheep show up to eat, especially in past times, when they would move from one pasture to another pasture, they would basically eat all the grass in that pasture. And so, when they left, there was no more grass left because they ate so much. This caused a lot of problems in the days of the Old West because when sheep came through an area, they basically left nothing behind. There was absolutely nothing. There was no more grass for other cattle to come and eat. The same problem also applies to you and to me. Think about all the times in your life that you have used everyone else for your own selfish greed. All the times that you have taken things from everyone else because it made you feel good. But in doing that, you left everything in a way of devastation and hurt. Sometimes we are that person. Not only that, but sheep are so focused on their eating that they don't see what the other sheep are doing. And they can easily be led astray from the flock. Just like a sheep, how many times have you been so focused on doing that one thing that made you feel good? And before you know it, it becomes an addiction that takes you away from the real people who truly care about you. We, in different times in our life, we become that sheep that's just so focused on one thing. Lastly, sheep also can't digest all the grass that they have eaten until they're actually laying down. And so, they don't always lay down on their own. So the shepherd sometimes has to make a sheep to lie down for their own good. Think about that. 
Sometimes the shepherd has to make them lie down for their own good because they're too stubborn to do that themselves. How many times have you and I been so stubborn to just keep on doing the same thing over and over and over, getting the same thing all the time? And the shepherd sometimes has to step into our life and say, hey, you need to just lay low. You need to just relax. You need a time out so that you can start digesting the grass in your life. That's all of us. Okay? All right. And so, it's not good enough for us to just hear about the lion and the sheep. Okay? We got to do something about this. Let's apply the message today into our life. So here we go. How can you become a stronger lion for Jesus or a better sheep follower of Jesus? Put that into your thoughts. I want you to reflect about that question. Pray about that for one minute. How can you become a stronger lion for Jesus or a better sheep follower of Jesus? Pray about that, please. So here at the end, this is the reason why our sermon question is, what does it mean by the lion and the lamb? That's Jesus Christ. But that's also us. And so that's the reason why here at the end, if there's the one takeaway, if there's one thing that you guys can remember from the entire sermon, it is this. Jesus is the lion and the lamb. And that's the reason why this week, uh, this week's sermon was... March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. Now next week when you guys come back, uh, we're going to be focusing again on this concept of March because it's the month of March. What big sporting event happens in March? Okay. So next week when you guys come back, we're going to be talking about a March madness. Okay. That's going to be our theme for next week. March madness. Okay? Let's pray together, you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for just loving us so much. Lord God, thank you for just bringing your, your children back together here at your holy temple. So that, Lord God, we can just give you all the glory. We can just praise you. And Lord God, thank you for just allowing this concept of seasonal weather. Lord God, talking about this lion that comes in and this lamb that's ho hopefully going to, to lead this weather. But Lord God, we can also relate that to you, Jesus Christ, that you are that lion, that you are that lamb. So Lord God, in our life, help us so that we can also become more like you. Help us to be that fierce, powerful lion so when temptations come our way, we can stand strong in you. But Lord God, help us to also be that lamb that you are. Help us to be obedient. Help us to follow the great shepherd. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And so, there is no other better song for us to end this today than the Lion and His blood breaks the chain.